Dear all, I would like to ask you to have a seat. Now we are about to start our panel free or our work today with the title of Strengthening Resilience, the Most Vulnerable to Economic Adversity, Upskilling, Financing, Job, and the Green Economy. Uh, the moderator for the third panel is I am Deputy Director General Amy Pope. Amy, floor is yours. Thank you so much, and it is such a pleasure to be here with all of you um, talking about one of my favorite things, uh, strengthening the resilience of the most vulnerable to economic adversity. This is about upskilling, financing jobs, and the green economy. Um, and I am very, very excited to be here with a tremendous panel, who I will introduce in, in just a moment, but um, we're very, very lucky to have them here. While migration is often used by households as an adaptation strategy to cope with environmental shocks, when it's unregulated, it can put migrants and their families and, frankly, their communities at greater risk. It's therefore essential that migrants and their households become more resilient through gaining necessary skills, education, and have access to finance and knowledge, which will allow them to make better strategic decisions. Today's panel is going to review recent cases in labor mobility, as well as crisis-driven displacement, to see how migrants and their households can be best supported in their times of very, very critical need. Migration, as we know, when it is voluntary, when it's well-planned, when it's regular, it's, it's been used over the years, for centuries really, as an adaptation strategy, and particularly to cope with environmental shocks. DDG, sorry, if yeah. there's a problem on Zoom, ah. they don't have audio at the moment. Can okay. you just pause for a yes. seconds? I'm, I'm apologizing. No problem. Yeah, okay. I won't revisit all of it, but I'll start where I left off because I think it, it um, will be enough for those following along on Zoom to follow. Uh, migration, as we know here at IOM, when it is well planned, when it's voluntary, when it's regular, it's been used as an adaptation strategy to cope with environmental shocks. We know young people can use migration as a path toward acquiring knowledge and skills, and it also can reduce the burden on their families. Labor mobility offers tremendous opportunities for diversifying incomes and allows especially young people, but all workers, to gain a broader outlook. And that's particularly important when we're talking about families who are often facing multiple shocks, particularly in this day and, day and age, when we're looking at the impact of COVID and inflation and economic pressures in addition to other conflicts. But the rapid onset of climate events food shortages, labor market disruption, what we're seeing right now can compel individuals and families to depart with very few assets, making use of irregular channels, and eventually putting them at risk of greater exploitation and abuse, both in transit and at their destination. Several stakeholders, including our colleagues with us at ILO, have noticed the concern that with COVID-19 and the associated economic and social crises, these really have ex ex exacerbated the conditions of employment, access to health, and social protection for people who are already tremendously vulnerable. We're particularly concerned about the exploitation of children and, force, and people who are forced into labor. And so it's incredibly important that we monitor the incidence of exploitation that we make investments in compliance, that we look at gender responsive mechanisms, so that we tackle every single angle relating to social protection, and particularly recognizing that migrants might have more limited access to education and other tools that would allow them to, make, to become more resilient. I know that other panels have talked about how we strengthen the resilience of migrants and their families. And the conversation today is really going to talk about what tools we can bring when we talk about improving collaboration between governments, between countries, to provide more regular, safe channels for migration. We have three incredible speakers with us here today. And they're gonna talk about some of the recent cases that they've seen 
both with labor mobility, but also how it can apply to crisis-driven displacement. And that what they've seen can allow migrants to build resilience. This is a really good introduction to what is a big, big topic that I know a lot of us have interest in and where we can draw on responses that can be applied globally. So I'm going to start first with um, our, I'll introduce our panel members. First, we have Eduardo Jose de Vega, who is the undersecretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs within the Philippines. And it's really a delight to have the undersecretary here with us today. I was just in the Philippines last week. I can tell you from firsthand experience that the country is really on the cutting edge of looking at how we can empower migrants, how we can build solutions with, with both the hosting country and the sending country that allow people to have access both to um, economic opportunities, but skills development um, and, and really at a benefit for all people, including those um, in the hosting country. I'm also here with Michelle Layton, who's the branch chief of the labor migration branch within ILO. And ILO is an extremely important partner to us at IOM. And we only are looking to deepen this partnership in the years to come as we look to labor mobility as an increasingly important solution. Finally, I have one of our star chiefs of mission, Vladimir Georgiev. Did I say that okay? <laughs> He's our chief of mission in Azerbaijan, who's going to bring some of his real life experiences to bear as we talk through some great case examples. So maybe I'll start with a first question and I'll open it up first to the undersecretary. Um, and then I'll ask each of our panel members to give us um, some of their own perspective. But really, when we look at what policies are needed to reduce short term vulnerabilities of people on the move, and to increase their own and their family members' resilience to economic shocks in the long run. What works and maybe what doesn't work? If I could turn it over to you. Hey, good afternoon. Um, well, we were glad to uh, welcome you to the Philippines, Madam, always. Um, uh, of course, um, as the new Deputy Minister for Migrant Workers Affairs of the Philippines, it's a great privilege for me to be part of this year's session of the dialogue. And uh, of course, it's well known, as you mentioned, the uh, uh, work being done by the Philippines to strengthen resilience among our migrants. Now, uh, what works? Well, one, you have to be a champion. You have to be a champion country. You have to be known to be a champion country uh, for safe, orderly, and regular migration. Uh, the Philippines is known as a champion country for all migration governance. And because of our active global discussions on migration policy uh, and uh, what we have sought to achieve in this end, uh, our foreign policy, in fact, is founded strongly on what we think should be a sustainable migration for the benefit of uh, the very global uh, Filipino. So we played a significant role in the crafting of the GCM and we're proud of how it promotes a cooperative framework among states for the protection of model mi migrants. So, so one thing, uh, for migrants to be resilient, vulnerabilities and risks in all stages of migration should be reduced. So that's where you see in the GCM, uh, something which the Philippines lobbied for is uh, the inclusion of um, uh, measures to enhance regular pathways uh, for migration that facilitate labor mobility and address uh, illegal trafficking. So uh, that's uh, one, one thing important. Uh, we advocate social protections and portability of social security entitlements of migrants. Um, so this reduces the vulnerabilities of migrants through the migration cycle. Now the COVID, we, we mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, well, we the elephant in the room, and uh, I'm glad that we're having this meeting, uh, not just virtually, uh, but mixed, uh, live. And uh, so it masks our gaps on uh, labor mobility, particularly on the massive displacement of migrants. So what happened in the case of the Philippines, 2 million uh, migrants from abroad out of about 10 million uh, had to be returned within a very short period of time. And I'm sure this has been the experience of many other countries of origin. Uh, that had to bring home their own nationals. So um, one thing necessary is that you have to have in each government uh, a system of providing them financial and welfare assistance 
uh, to keep them out of harm's way. It's not just uh, the responsibility of international organizations, but your own governments who should be spending money um, to um, help them adjust. Because we look at it this way, um, in the Philippines, uh, a lot of our... our a lot of our resources come from the remittances of migrant workers. So we're just giving back uh, to them. So, um, and uh, these pathways for increased mobility uh, complemented our efforts to um, forge global partnerships with a lot of uh, migrant receiving uh, countries. Uh, for example, in the Middle East, so we, we've had discussions with Bahrain and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Uh, and uh, we've had groundbreaking efforts to introduce reforms in their labor systems and how to fight trafficking. So in the Philippines also, we have our, our own uh, government created a new ministry called the Department of Migrant Workers, uh, which consolidates all existing offices with migration-related functions into one entity. Uh, everything from recruitment, from providing online assistance, from a... a uh, assisting them uh, in cases of uh, uh, labor issues or um, uh, criminal cases that they face abroad, up to the time they have to go home and get reintegrated into the country. So this made the country, our country, the first to include in its domestic laws an explicit provision on the uh, progressive realization of the objectives of the Global Compact. So uh, we strongly uh, uh, support the recommendation to enhance and diversify the availabilities of pathways for migration. And now we, uh, this theme, of course, this year is a climate change show. It's become an important driver for migration. So one thing important is to uh, look for sectors in your respective countries where, uh, where migrants often come from. In our country, uh, the new president of the Philippines has made agriculture our top priority, recognizing how climate change impacts food security and the fragile economic foundation of our rural community. So uh, because of that, uh, we're trying to strengthen the agricultural base, and it, and it does work. Um, what's happening is that in recent times uh, in the Philippines, we've had more migrants coming from uh, skilled uh, uh, labor, meaning uh, it's not just uh, uh, household workers or uh, the lower paying uh, uh, jobs uh, where migrants from the Philippines uh, seek employment abroad, because now, and now, now more and more it's uh, also um, uh, improving in that respect. So um, you just have to have a focused approach towards it. Uh, the foreign policy of the Philippines is based not just on defending our country's integrity or, or, or advancing our, our cultural or, econ uh, or economic interests, but specifically protecting our overseas workers because they bring a lot. And especially in this globalized world, uh, it's part of uh, being part of one global community. And to all uh, fellow uh, migrant sending countries, and of course, so countries who are so have been so hospitable to our workers, we thank you. So, it's just a matter of the eff focused effort. Yes. yes, thank you, madam. I'd like to take the opportunity to point out um, that the Philippines is the first country to implement um, the GCM by by with the creation of this um, new department, but. Um, codifying into to your own policies and practices, uh, protections for workers is really, um, I think, an important um, model for, for many countries to follow. So it's so really important. And, and frankly, the work that you're doing with the Gulf countries to yes. negotiate um, these protections for workers is something that will benefit, I think, more than just Filipino workers, but, but workers from around the world who are now working um, in the Gulf. And again, it's a really positive model. So um, really, really exciting to watch what you're doing and such a pleasure to have you here to share your real life examples with us. Um, I'll now turn to um, Michelle Layton, who is the branch chief at the ILO. And, and in addition to the policies that are needed to reduce, reduce the short-term vulnerabilities, I'd also be curious if you have thoughts on challenges that have emerged 
rec recently with regarding the um, rights of migrant children and youth or, or those who are otherwise extraordinarily vulnerable? Are there, are there policies that you've seen which are successful to strengthen their resilience? Or are there any particular lessons that we can draw from some of the recent crises relating to labor mobility? It, mobility, especially when we're talking about addressing the root causes of displacement. Um, I know very, very big issues, um, and you have tremendous uh, uh, experience, so very much looking forward to your views on any of the above. Thanks very much, Amy, and it's really a pleasure to be here for ILO, and sorry that our Director General was uh, unable to be here today, but um, he's very um, concerned about this issue. I might uh, take a step back and maybe talk about the broader approaches of ILO and some of the areas we see that are of concern and, and some challenges. As many of you know, this year intensified heat waves, fires, floods, desertification, droughts, and the impacts uh, on climate change on people and their communities and jobs and livelihoods have been tremendously devastating. The most vulnerable continue to be the ones who are most acutely affected, and many of them are forced to leave. And the relationship between climate change, employment, and livelihoods, and migration is rather complex, and certainly highly context-dependent. Even where we see environmental or climate hotspots, environmental change and shocks are joined by a range of other social, political, economic challenges that these communities face, of course, poverty, lack of access to financial services, how uh, low levels of education and localized tension and conflict. And it's within this context that the IPCC, for the first time, identified with high confidence that climate change uh, and extreme weather events are increasingly driving displacement in all regions. It determined that people in vulnerable regions will experience further erosion of livelihood security, which can interact with humanitarian crises such as displacement and forced migration. And we know that this is going to perpetuate more vulnerability uh, among communities. ILO estimates in, uh, that by 2030, 2.2% of total working hours worldwide will be lost to temperatures, high temperatures, and that's a productivity loss of about 80 million full-time jobs. And this is in a time when we want to increase job creation. Floods and other disasters, of course, cause immediate displacement, but we're also concerned that the effects of prolonged drought and degradation take longer time to put pressure on people and their families to migrate as a coping strategy, which, which Amy mentioned. And this is a reality we know that is already taking place in sub-Saharan Africa. This is not something that we are going to see in the future. It's happening now. And as you said, when it's well managed, migration uh, can ensure that people can diversify their income, they gain skills, they can invest in their home communities and build resilience. And we also know that increasing their adaptive capacity is going to go a long way to helping make migration a choice rather than a necessity. But this will not happen automatically. People affected by climate change will move, but our policies haven't necessarily caught up with that. And without regular pathways that offer protection, they're likely to be forced into taking irregular and dangerous channels, forced into the informal economy. Uh, and this puts them at risk of forced labor and trafficking, but certainly lower wages and poor working conditions. We know that if these pathways are well managed, people can contribute to increase their adaptive capacities and also help ensure their families are protected. But they need fair wages, fair working conditions, access to social protection, and they need them for their families. So the proper governance of migration is truly at the center of how we are going to address these threats. And I think we, we can point to certain tools, as you mentioned, that are available to us now. Uh, and, and I want to discuss some of these in the context of these challenges. ILO has adopted Recommendation 205, which is a standard that contains guidance to improve employment and job creation in crisis situations. We've also adopted what is a programmatic roadmap for countries, uh, which are general principles, uh, guiding principles on access of refugees and other forcibly displaced persons to the labor market and 
These, we think, are also playing in tandem with something else the ILO has that you may be familiar with, which is an initiative for a just transition towards sustainable and green economies. So green jobs, but also green economies. And what this means is the inclusion of migrant workers and their families in climate responses, including migrants with multiple backgrounds and vulnerabilities, recognizing their intersectional realities, being women, being indigenous people, being people who um, uh, face distinct challenges in relation to climate impacts, and the policies need to respond to them accordingly. But we also see there are real opportunities um, for creating better jobs. And one of our reports identifies that there could be creation of 100 million jobs worldwide in sectors such as sustainable energy, among others, by 2030. But to do this, we will need to have serious investments in skills and upskilling, reskilling, um, and also to ensure that future generations are not lost to unemployment. Now, there will be, and there is, migration in all regions. So an important step that, that countries need to think about now is considering how to upgrade or modernize their labor migration, migration policies, if you will, to ensure that people can gain new skills, fill labor shortages, and protect them in the workplace. And this can be challenging because labor migration policies are still fragmented across the world. They're not consistent and they're not necessarily rights-based. But member states and other stakeholders are engaging in new approaches and we were very excited to hear during the IMRF many of, of uh, recognition of those practices including some adopting new humanitarian visas and other channels for regular movement of climate affected migrants. The ILO has been working with governments in this context but particularly on regional migration pathways that include climate displacement, displacement as one of the areas in which they can move. We've supported the Intergovernmental Authority for Development, the EGAD, in East Africa, for example, in their free movement protocol, which is the first time it recognizes that climate is a legitimate reason to move and move through those regular pathways. And in the Asia Pacific region, we're working with countries to improve those labor migration frameworks so that employment and migration policy find much more policy coherence together. With Bangladesh and Tuvalu, for example, we've helped integrate rights-based labor migration planning in directly in the climate adaptation strategies that they're developing. And this is something we'd like to promote further. And of course, together with IOM, we're supporting the regional discussions around a regional labor mobility framework in the Pacific. This will be the first time this kind of, um, this kind of uh, agreement exists that recognizes labor mobility, skills transfer, and protection as central features. Our constituents in the business community are also upscaling their efforts, um, doing a lot more for training on entrepreneurship and green jobs, working on value chains with local communities to see where green jobs might help in the future, what is the capacity for that and for upskilling, and the trade unions are increasing work at migrant resource centers to offer legal advice, counseling, job counseling, but also other uh, protection measures, information to avoid trafficking and forced labor and so on for those who are affected by climate change. And we see the direct benefits that social dialogue can bring. Certainly there are many opportunities in uh, the ASEAN's form of migrant labor, the ASEAN and Mercosur and SADC, there are tripartite discussions going on. But we are not seeing enough of this. Um, and something, uh, some of this does come up in our governing body and in our international labor conference. And so employers are calling for more regular and organized dialogue with member states between the private sector and government, and of course with trade unions to talk about how we can have more data-driven, evidence-based policy making in labor migration. So let me turn finally to the potential for the UN system to support the kind of national work that I've just touched on, but also more synergies at the international level in the debates. We co-chair with IOM and the UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change Secretariat, the UN Network's thematic working group on climate, the GCM, and the Paris Agreement. We're also happy at the same time to be supporting the Task Force on Displacement, which is uh, under the Warsaw International Mechanism created by the Paris Agreement, uh, and that is in the climate negotiations under the UNFCCC. And we see it, a number of synergies that aren't happening that could happen. In 2018, the task force, for example, adopted overall guidance that linked to the GCM 
and it was adopted in 2018 just as the GCM was adopted. Um, and so that guidance needs to be realized or operationalized, if you will. The task force at the same time is now going to move forward on technical guidance for countries who are in those climate change negotiations and for member states looking at adaptation plans. And we've committed under this work plan with uh, a number of the experts, including IOM, UNHCR, um, the Platform on Disaster Displacement to support the member state-led task force to develop this technical guidance with the input of the UN network and the stakeholder consultations that we've agreed to hold so that we can have the voices and inputs and lessons from around the world. And we really think that, these, um, that this new technical guidance should be able to help governments expand the regular pathways in a number of fronts. Certainly, we would promote the labor mobility front. Now, let me just conclude by um, recommitting or, or expressing our commitment of the ILO to work very closely with all of you, with IOM, with our sister agencies as we move forward in this. This is a huge issue. You mentioned it, Amy, when you started. And we have uh, a new policy brief coming out that we'll release uh, in Sharm El Sheikh at the Conference of the Parties, COP27, on just transitions and labor mobility. And we'll be co-sponsoring a number of events. So if any of you will be there, we hope to bring the migration and environment and climate change communities together there to talk more about some of the, the work that's going on on the ground. Um, we look forward to working with you and, and supporting more social justice and climate justice as we move forward. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. That's fantastic. And um, we also are, are very, very excited to be working on this issue with you. Um, now, uh, to the field, to the real life examples that, that we're seeing play out, uh, we have our chief of mission here from Azerbaijan. Uh, Vladimir, can I turn it over to you? Thank you very much, uh, DDG. Uh, dear distinguished uh, participants uh, of the panel, uh, excellencies, uh, uh, and uh, online participants. Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure uh, and opportunity for me to represent uh, one specific uh, project that uh, my mission is uh, implementing uh, in the last uh, 21 years. Uh, well, uh, I would just uh, like to share uh, this uh, for me an, an excellent uh, example of uh, how uh, historical knowledge uh, of uh, the people and uh, uh, can be uh, revived uh, and used uh, for a better uh, future. Uh, basically, uh, in IOM Azerbaijan, we are implementing the project uh, Integrated uh, Rural Development for inter Internally Displaced uh, Population in Azerbaijan through revitalization of the Kakris water systems. Or Kakris is also known uh, as a Kanat in uh, Iran or Iraq, Fogaras uh, in uh, Northern Africa, or uh, uh, different names, uh, but the purpose is the same, to bring uh, water uh, to the surface uh, with a natural slope. And this water, basically, it's used by the people since uh, ancient uh, times. Uh, it's used uh, in the countries uh, like Morocco, Italy, Turkey, Oman, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, China, Afghanistan, Pakistan. We can see all of these countries around the world. Basically, these are the silent witness of uh, human development and migration, I would say. Uh, basically, these are uh, built countries uh, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago. And actually, we are witnessing their development, the development of the humans who live around those countries. But also we are witnessing the ignorance of those Kakrises and the abundance of the Kakrises. But also in Azerbaijan, we are also seeing the revival for a better and more sustainable future. Basically, the project itself, uh, uh, it's uh, to address uh, negative effects of the livelihoods of the rural population in Azerbaijan, which is around 40% uh, of the total population is engaged in agriculture sector which makes agriculture the second biggest sector of the economy after the oil. And of course, in the agriculture, uh, the lack of water can have a big problem, but not just for the agriculture, but also for hygienic uh, and other well-being of the individual households, and overall with the rural communities and economic development in Azerbaijan. Uh, 
Uh, indeed, also uh, the growing population and uh, shortages of the water for irrigation leads to decline of household incomes, decrease in living standards, and serves as a push factor for economic outmigration from rural communities. With uh, our approach, uh, we are genuinely addressing the water shortages problems within these rural uh, uh, populations and rural areas. And we already successfully implement tested and proven, but also effective, uh, of eco-friendly hydraulic systems called CAHRISES. Uh, well, uh, the main advantage of this approach uh, is that once this CAHRIS is uh, rehabilitated, uh, it provides a sustainable uh, water all year around, not for 10 years, but for hundreds of years. So talk about sustainability. We just need to look into the history in order to better to understand what is going to happen into the future. And then uh, it also helped uh, to create uh, low-income communities who are with the low financial capacities and limited access to electricity, free water. Uh, and these are all communities of IDPs who were affected from the first Karabakh war in uh, late 80s, early 90s. In addition to the rehabilitation of these cachrises, actually, it's not only about the rehabilitation of the cachrises. Uh, we did uh, so much more. Uh, first, uh, although it's a highly technical, sometimes risky job to rehabilitate uh, these cachrises, uh, basically we focus on the water discharge uh, from these water cachrises for drinking purpose, for irrigation, but also we move an extra step in our work. Uh, we start to implement innovative technology, and this innovative technology allows us to renovate faster, effective, effective, cheaper, and more safer without any risks. In addition to this rehabilitation, we also created the handbook, handbook for establishment of small and medium businesses. And basically, this is also in line with the ILO uh, criteria for that one. Uh, and this uh, handbook was used to train a number of uh, IDPs. Uh, and also, in addition to the training, they also receive uh, small grants to which they were able to establish their small uh, businesses. In addition, once they are trained, those people can also apply to the Ministry of Social Protection and Labor. Uh, and they can apply to the social protection funds and receive additional funds for their small and medium businesses. Well, this combination of access to water and establishing businesses created opportunities for further growth and help support IDPs to better adapt for their livelihoods and future. In addition to that one, we are establishing water user committees uh, and where 50% of uh, these committees are women's. Basically, they are making decision how the water will be used, for what purpose, for what distribution. And in addition to that one, the water user, water user committee, once the CAHRIS is rehabilitated, actually will continue to make sure that that CAHRIS will have its own life for many years to come. They will be the one to take charge of maintenance and support of that CAHRIS. In addition, we also work with the academia in Azerbaijan. We established the CAHRIS Research and Information Center. And with this academia, now there is also a website, very useful website, that uh, everyone who is interested into CAHRIS uh, rehabilitation can access and learn or visit the institutions or academia. In addition to this one, we also work with the Ministry of Environment, uh, Ministry of Labor, Social Protection, uh, other water, uh, supply institution, and also we work with the national adaptation plan where we would like to include migration aspects uh, into that uh, national adaptation plan. In addition to this one, uh, we also in 2021 receive uh, an Energy Globe Award for sustainability out of 1,800 projects that apply worldwide, uh, IOM Azerbaijan received award for this specific uh, uh, project. So let me try to uh, sum up uh, my presentation with uh, one very interesting uh, 
uh, aspect. Uh, in May uh, 2020 in Baku, uh, I had the privilege to participate uh, as a part of the public uh, and listen uh, uh, Michele De Lucci, he is a well-known Italian design and designer, uh, architect, awarded uh, with a number of uh, awards around the world, uh, where he actually started to talk, he was invited to talk about uh, regener regeneration, design, new technology for sustainable future. And then during his presentation, actually he mentioned that he worked with a team of uh, anthropologists, uh, philosophers, uh, architects, uh, sociologists, and they come up with some sort of an idea how probably future will look alike. They say that the future will look alike like interactors where work office and interaction with the schools will be happening in actually one place. Then they say that uh, in the future, most of the things will be built by hands and by local communities. We will have education stations within these interactors and small communities. And they say that these stations will be happy stations. When I heard that one, actually, somehow I connect with what we are currently doing in Azerbaijan. Actually, we are working with the small villages. We are establishing uh, better work. Uh, we are helping them. We are actually using the local community to build the capacity and actually if I may say so, we are actually living the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Um, so we we get are now we are now at the fun part of the conversation, uh, where we open up uh, the floor to all of you to ask your questions or provide your comments or feedback. Um, we'd love to hear from you. I know many of you uh, in the audience, and if folks are listening online, have important points of view that you'd like to, to bring into the conversation. But um, if I may exercise my uh, prerogative as chair and start the questions, um, I think sometimes when we talk about labor mobility, in particular with populations that are extremely vulnerable or already in distress or um, are living on the, uh, uh, in extreme poverty, for example, there are always questions about how do we make sure even the process of recruiting people um, and make sure that, that the conditions on which under which they are employed are not themselves exploitative. Um, and I know uh, all of you at the table have, have good experience with um, policies and practices that allow us to protect the most vulnerable so that they are able to um, really benefit from the migration and um, uh, not just in terms of the money they earn while working, but also in terms of knowledge and skills transfer. So um, if I could open that up, what do we see as, as sort of the best tools for protecting those who are most vulnerable? Yes. Um, well, one thing we actually do in the Philippines is to um, uh, have also the migrants themselves uh, uh, protect themselves in the sense that we encourage uh, uh, overseas Filipino groups uh, um, to themselves uh, create uh, these uh, help centers which coordinate with the government to tell us about uh, possible problems or more important um, to report to us about um, this or that illegal recruitment activity which is going on. It's actually, to be frank, it's um, it's it's almost in a Pandora's box where you, you can't close it again. I mean, you can only limit it. Uh, um, we we're talking about how they could be exploited or what. We put up the mechanisms uh, to try to regulate, uh, uh, in accordance with the GCM, the uh, deployment of workers abroad and come out with labor agreements. But sometimes uh, they will just take um, undocumented means out, um, and uh, it will be a problem. Uh, that's why we also have to work hand in hand with civil society. Uh, it's not just uh, a, a government uh, 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 a government responsibility. It's uh, international cooperation under the framing of a whole of government and a whole of society approach. So. Um, 
yes, uh, it's, it's an issue. We are aware of that. But we also look at the fact that it has the situation, as far as the Philippines is concerned, has greatly improved. Uh, when this started in the 90s, I would say the vast majority of Filipinos, um, well, I wouldn't say the vast majority, but the majority of Filipinos might have been uh, easy victims of uh, trafficking groups or groups which uh, did send them abroad legally, but uh, for less pay than they were promised. So it's a matter of uh, um, 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 ensuring that uh, we're trying to work to lessen this, uh, this uh, incidence. Another thing we do, the Philippines is now fighting uh, uh, or combating with other nations the, uh, the phenomenon of wage theft. And uh, when uh, foreign employers realize that um, the sending country is going to be relentless in pointing out uh, what, that this should be done, that should be done, this should be done, it builds momentum, which somehow uh, lessens the incidences of uh, human trafficking. Uh, there's no one size fits all approach. Uh, but one thing I, we do recommend the Philippines that government work together with a civil society, so a tripartite thing, eh? the, between the government, the uh, people, the migrants themselves, and uh, the employers. So, so that's one approach we take. Thank you. So whole society of approach um, and, and real advocacy on behalf of the government um, uh, itself to protect its workers sounds key. Uh, Michelle, do you want to jump in here? Sure. I mean, you asked about recruitment, and that yeah. uh, is a huge concern of ours, and I think many even in this in this room and online. Um, we uh, we are very concerned because obviously those who have to be taking informal or irregular pathways are going to find themselves um, in situations where labor brokers may approach them and charge very high recruitment fees and costs, and that puts them at risk of debt bondage, forced labor, and trafficking. Um, we adopted the Global Fair Recruitment Initiative, and it's operating in about 30 countries. Um, we're very happy to work with the Philippines, and very happy countries like um, Mexico and Italy and others are really stepping up, um, as well as our partners in Africa. But very pleased to see, in fact, that most recently the United States adopted a fair recruitment guidance uh, for H-2 visa holders in the United mm -hmm. States. And we think these are the kinds of measures that are going to be needed to first raise awareness about the problems in the recruitment process. It's the most unregulated area of migration and, and labor migration governance, certainly. Um, but also to ensure that there are, there are mechanisms for oversight. And that means cooperation, and I'm glad the Undersecretary mentioned this, cooperation between sending and uh, receiving countries, origin and destination. Because you can't, you, you can adopt all of the, the recruitment policies and programs and regulatory um, requirements in your own country, but because this is about people moving across and overseas and labor brokers operate in the margins and undetected yeah. and between jurisdictions, you really have to work with bilaterally with countries that are receiving migrant workers, but also within a multilateral context. Otherwise, it's not, it's not going to work. And this is something that we're really encouraging governments to, um, to take measures to uh, uh, eliminate. Um, and they can do that, because when you ensure that there are fair recruitment processes and you have that oversight and monitoring, and it's between the countries who are receiving origin and destination, then the labor brokers who are violating the law and, and criminal and, and really nefarious brokers who take money from these migrant workers and put them at risk, they have nowhere to go. So they are exposed. And this is something I think that's going to affect whether they're climate migrants, migrants who are women migrant workers who are in the most vulnerable situations, or others, um, those even affected by COVID. We've just seen a lot of those kind of abuses. So. We would, we would very much, um, and, and we think it starts the beginning of the abuse process that leads to wage theft and substitution of jobs, as the Undersecretary mentioned, because in the recruitment process, they won't have contracts, they won't have access to their rights, and they'll be unprotected when they get to destination and have nowhere to go. So thank you for raising that concern, Amy. Yes. Uh, one thing uh, the Philippines noticed as well is when your firm 
and don't blink, the receiving country or their institutions eventually will cooperate with you. I won't mention countries, but uh, there have been countries which were um, uh, putting as part of the legal, legal process uh, a certain exorbitant service fees for our uh, work, which our workers have to pay for the recruitment agencies. And we said, well, well, we're not going to allow them to work. We're not going to uh, verify their employment contracts because we, we, we don't agree with that. Eventually, they give in because they, they, they do realize that, uh, uh, you know, it has to be win-win, a win-win uh, situation. But the Philippines has the advantage, though, of um, uh, uh, the fact that Filipinos work everywhere. Yeah. So they don't go here, they could go there. So uh, that's something. But one, that's a piece of good news. Uh, host countries, uh, and we thank uh, host countries uh, receiving migrant workers all over the world. Let me see, and thank you, uh, Shukran, uh, for 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 listening to uh, our ad advocacies and uh, our uh, well, I wouldn't say please, but our firm requests um, uh, for us to put up the mechanisms uh, so that uh, there's no um, exorbitant uh, fee charging or, or uh, the possibility of uh, trafficking. Uh, there is another uh, situation wherein. Possibly uh, to bypass legal means, I mean the recognized deployment uh, and recruitment means, what some countries do is to accept foreigners as trainees uh, or as um, students with the ability to work afterwards. So that's a phenomenon. Uh, we, we're still adjusting to that because um, it's completely legal in the host country, but as far as we're concerned, we don't know how to to categorize our departing uh, countrymen and countrywomen because they're supposed to be going about only as interns, supposed to be coming back, but there is a process for them to stay legally in the host country. But uh, in that way, they're not part of our uh, our recruitment um, process. So uh, it's it's a it's an evolving it's a world evolves and um, uh, we'll we'll adjust in accordance with it, but I do think that uh, we have uh, succeeded in great, uh, me in, by, by, by leaps and bounds in protecting uh, migrants around the world, and we'll continue to do so. Thank you. Do you see anything in particular that works to protect the most vulnerable to ensure they're not exploited? For me, uh, personally, uh, and I believe uh, we share the same uh, vision, it's that uh, there is a necessity uh, for uh, inclusiveness, uh, meaning that uh, when we talk about uh, vulnerable population, uh, we talk about human beings. Uh, they need to be involved into any consultation or participation uh, when it comes to the development of uh, policies or uh, national uh, strategies. Uh, with this, uh, I think we will make sure that uh, uh, also those who might be most vulnerable will also raise their voice and uh, we will hear their concerns. Uh, on the same time, we will also have the uh, local institutions, uh, international institutions, uh, UN agencies who will help to develop those policies and strategy for uh, benefit of, uh, of the, the citizens. Uh, uh, and I think, uh, mm, Indeed, uh, it's not a kind of solution that uh, uh, provides, uh, uh, it's not a solution that uh, once time resolve uh, everything. I think mm -hmm. uh, we have to be aware that all of these uh, strategies and, and policies are uh, very dynamic. Uh, and um, I think uh, GCM uh, give a, a great uh, opportunity to see how migration should be managed. Uh, and it's great that uh, all the member states are supporting uh, GCM, and uh, I think with uh, GCM vision and uh, with all this necessary consultation and inclusiveness, uh, I think we will see uh, very good uh, results. Uh, but I would also like to say that uh, those results uh, needs to come very soon. I think uh, this morning we heard uh, our DG when he was saying it's not a matter of uh, also discussing, but also a matter of urgency. Uh, we heard that one point. Uh, 
1.3 billion um, internal migrants uh, are existing around the world. One billion people um, have problems uh, to access a proper land for agriculture. Uh, climate change is there. So I think there is a need, a sense for urgency, and a lot of work uh, which uh, is ahead of us. I see our colleague from FAO, um, who's been a good partner in, in a lot of this work, um, has your hand up. Go ahead. Madam Chair, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start by thanking the esteemed speakers, participants, and organizers for drawing the attention to this increasingly important topic. Climate change is already negatively impacting food production and food security around the world, particularly for low-income households and small-scale farmers. Food security, rural lives, and livelihoods will be increasingly affected by projected future climate change with direct and indirect impacts on human mobility. FAO supports rural communities to better manage climate-related risks by helping create climate-resilient livelihoods and green job opportunities in rural areas, while also promoting the sustainable and ma uh, use and management of resources. For instance, FAO's action against desertification has helped to restore the productivity of degraded lands and the livelihoods of local communities in the Sahel region. More than 500 rural communities have seen improved food security and income generation opportunities through the development of value chains linked to the restoration of uh, degraded lands, which benefited in particular women and youth to improve their livelihoods and resilience. In rural communities of Sierra Leone, Zimbabwe, and Timor-Leste, affected by environmental de degradation, depletion of natural resources, and severe lack of decent jobs, FAO strengthens the resilience of rural economies by building the capacities of young men and women in green agriculture, green energy, and waste management, and supporting the implementation of green businesses through public green employment schemes. Migration is a common adaptation strategy for rural households and has the potential to strengthen the household's adaptive capacity and con uh, contribute to building climate resilient li uh, livelihoods. In order to strengthen the resilience of vulnerable communities and to tap into the potential of migration to contribute to climate change adaptation and mitigation, it is of critical importance to create enabling environments in areas of origin, transit, and destination and recognize gender-specific needs. This will require improved coherence and coordination between sectoral policies and programming, as well as enhanced collaboration between policy actors at all levels. Thank you for your attention and for providing a platform for this timely discussion. Thank you very much. Um, we now have a list of speakers, so I'll turn to the Eurasian Economic Commission uh, for your comments, please. Thank you. Dear participants of the session, ladies and gentlemen, the Eurasian Economic Commission is a permanent supranational body of the Eurasian Economic Union. In the Commission, I serve as a member of the board and represent of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Aside from economic and financial policy, I supervise labor migration issue. I would like to note that the interaction between the Commission and the IOM has a rich history based on the Memorandum of Cooperation between our organization signed in 2013. The Global Compact adopted at the 73rd session in the UN General Assembly in December 2018 reflects the Commission's recommendations based on the experience of Eurasian integration in the field of labor migration. The Commission holds the acts as an observer at the annual meetings of the IOM Council. The formation of a common single labor market is an of on the goals of the Eurasian Economic Union. Today, the EAEU labor market comprises of 93 million workers for whom all conditions are created for legal, voluntary, and safe labor migration. We created the digital system work without borders as a <clears throat> mechanism to promote the development of organized forms of employment. The system gives citizens the opportunity to, lay, to look for a job without leaving their place of residence and allows employers to recruit 
workers from other EAEU countries. Mobile applications are being launched to provide necessary services online in order to ensure the free movement of workers between countries. The single labor market, market is integrally linked to the issues of training through the system of vocational education. The Treaty of the Union regulates the direct recognition of educational documents. Also, the issue of recognition of qualifications is a matter of great importance. In the very near future, we plan to start, start to work on the concept for the development of the single EEU labor market with the involvement of international organizations, including the AO country offices in our member states. Despite the created conditions, we are number of difficulties faced by citizens of our status. They are mainly related to issues of poor awareness of citizens and the lack of certain skills. All this gives us reason to recommend of governments in to include migration issues in the development of local policies. The sending countries should provide uh, pre-departure preparation of citizens, including issues of training and retraining organized forms of employment. We host countries should provide conditions to legal stay of citizens, integration into local communities, and uh, protection of their rights. In conclusion, I would like to point out that the Commission supports the efforts of the International Organization of Migration, migration which works to improve the working and living conditions of migrants, protect their rights, and expand opportunities to self-fulfillment. The Commission also supports the AOM principle that humane and organized migration benefits both migrants and society. We are interested in the effective partnership that aims to promote social and economic progress, improve well-being and working conditions of people. Thank you. Thank you very much. I next have uh, the United States, followed by Morocco. Thank you to the distinguished panel members uh, and to Deputy Director General Pope for this important discussion on resilience that is both relevant and timely. We recognize that climate change exacerbates existing social, economic, and environmental vulnerabilities and can undermine food, water, and economic security. We appreciate that Deputy Director General Pope and others on this panel have had firsthand experience helping to respond to climate-induced disasters and displacement and have an invaluable perspective on this issue. With this recognition, the United States has deepened our support for climate change adaptation and is dedicated to reducing the risk of climate-related disasters and to building resilience to the impacts of natural hazards and climate change, including climate impacts that contribute to forced displacement and irregular migration. President Biden's emergency plan for adaptation and resilience, better known as PREPARE, aims to help more than half a billion people in developing countries adapt to and manage the impacts of climate change. Through PREPARE, we are investing in agricultural climate resilience in least developed countries. We've also invested in efforts to improve the climate resilience of food systems through expansion of our Feed the Future program and through contributions to the International Fund for Agricultural Development and the Food and Agricultural Organization. Russia's war on Ukraine exacerbated the food security crisis globally, adding to the impacts of drought and other environmental factors. In response, the United States has scaled up humanitarian food assistance globally, contributing nearly $6 billion to the World Food Program in 2022. Developing labor pathways are also a focus by promoting fair labor practices for migrant workers, uh, as Michelle noted earlier. For example, in the Western Hemisphere, the U.S. funds IOM to support development of host country government's capacity to promote access to regular labor pathways and reduce risk of exploitation of vulnerable migrants, including through ethical treatment, ethical recruitment. 
We were very pleased to see the prioritization of climate for projects funded by the Migration Multipartner Trust Fund and in support of the Global Compact. For this reason, we announced just last week a contribution of $5 million to the MPTF to support programs to benefit vulnerable migrants affected by climate change. This was a recommendation in the White House report on the impact of climate change on migration released last year in which many of our international organization partners and civil society organizations participating today met with us to discuss and provide their thoughts and recommendations. We appreciate and want to continue the conversation with all of you as we are doing today as we develop policies and support programs that address the nexus between climate change and migration. We look forward to building on the work that has been done here in Geneva as well as to the upcoming discussions to take place at COP27. Thank you. Thank you very much, Morocco. Uh, thank you. Uh, Honorable uh, Undersecretary for Migrant Workers Affairs of the Philippines, uh, Madam Deputy Director General, Excellencies, dear colleagues, let me first thank the IOM for this timely initiative with COP27 taking place in only a few weeks. The decision to dedicate this year IDM to the impacts of food insecurity and climate change on migration and displacement reflects a shared awareness of a common envir environmental destiny, a destiny rich in opportunities and challenges. In particular, this panel is an encounter with the future that my delegation would, wants to stress on, that of green economy. This issue lies at the intersection of sustainable development and fight against climate change, as well as it is now established, their consequences on displacement and migration. I will dedicate these few words to a region, the African continent, which bears a burden and for which the challenges are as important as the opportunities. Indeed, the need for green and more sustainable finance is born of a bitter observation. Africa, which accounts for only 1% of greenhouse ga gas emissions, is paradoxically the first victim of, of climate change. 20% of its economic production could disappear by 2050. At the same time, green financing is limited by the extractive nature of African economies, while electricity production in Africa will double by 2030, fossil fuels will still account for two-thirds of the energy mix. Africa therefore faces a double burden. A difficulty in accessing green finance, Africa mobilizes only 5% of climate finance, a high cost of green finance. When financing is secured, African countries pay higher costs for adaptation and mitigation. Excellencies, African success stories exist and they are duplicable. For their part, African financial institutions captured the breadth and depth of the challenges facing green finance. Thus, the funds allocated by the African Development Bank to climate change have increased from 9% in 2016 to 40% in 2021. In other words, they have increased fourfold in five years, totaling some $3.6 billion. In addition to the targeted aid provided by international financial institutions and foreign direct investments, a new innovative piece of this financial puzzle has materialized through labeled bonds known as green bonds. Green bond issues in Africa have increased by 495% from 2018 to 2019. As an example, the West African Development Bank raised in January 2021 some 750 million of green bonds, well below the market price. The trend was even more pronounced in Morocco in the wake of COP22 held in Marrakech in 2016. Green bonds issued by the Kingdom Financial Institutions raised eight times more funds than the initial targets, 380 million instead of 40 million. Despite these advances, the potential for, of growth remained significant. Of the one trillion in green bonds issued worldwide, less than 20% is, is, is from developing markets. Latin America and Africa combined account for less than 3% of global green bond issuance. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the inability of government to provide green finance has a direct impact on households. This is the very objective of this statement. Morocco strongly believes that it is a top-down 
approach supported and desired by inter the international community that will enable localized financing that can prevent forced displacement and produce sustainable economic opportunities for African citizens. There is a need to create a consensus on the importance of the increasing impact of climate change on human mobility. The means to address this issue does not limit themselves to green finance. We do believe, as Morocco, in African-led initiatives. The COP27 can build up on the outcomes of, the, of COP22, organized in Marrakesh, notably the AAA initiative, adaptation of African agriculture, the S initiative, sustainability, stability and security in Africa, the Blue Belt Initiative for Sustainable Fisheries in Africa, the Water for Africa Initiative, the African Youth Climate Hub Initiative, as well as the Coalition for Access to Sustainable Energy, especially with Ethiopia. I have only touched on a small part of the interrelationships here. As the various panelists have indicated, education, training, as well as fighting human trafficking are equally important in building the resilience of the most vulnerable. I particularly commend IOM's four messages to the COP27 and with which Morocco is in line, particularly for ensuring that human mobility linked to climate hazards is recognized and well addressed at local, national, regional, and international levels through dedicated climate change and migration policies with whole of government approaches. Ladies and gentlemen, Morocco has high hopes for carrying a message and action that combine resilience and economic development and will be present to do so at the COP27 in Egypt. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, for Morocco. Um, I next have the representative of Bangladesh, followed by uh, the representative of China, uh, who is online, and finally, the ambassador de Niger, qui est aussi en ligne. Thank you so much. Bangladesh, please. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I thank IOM for dedicating this, uh, this year's IDM to discuss uh, climate change, particularly when we are going to have uh, COP27 within uh, one month. And I would also like to thank the panelists for their very thought-provoking uh, discussions and observation. Uh, Madam Moderator, uh, as you are aware, Bangladesh is a highly climate vulnerable country. In fact, uh, uh, when I am, uh, uh, I am um, delivering this uh, statement, my country has already been hit by a very strong, very powerful uh, cyclone called Sitrang. So we have just been informed that it has, uh, it has hit our coastal areas. So, <clears throat> Madam, our people face the threat of uh, large-scale climate migration and displacement. And uh, we are also aware that uh, we are yet to have any global legal protection for the climate-induced migrants and displaced people. Um, uh, we know that uh, migration is a very effective um, uh, adaptation strategy. However, as a migrant uh, centering uh, country, we are also aware that there are lots of uh, vulnerabilities and uh, challenges that the migrants, particularly the uh, migrant workers, uh, face. As an effort to improve their uh, condition, the government of Bangladesh has undertaken different skilling, upskilling, and reskilling training programs. Uh, in, in the context of international migration, mutual recognition of skills, qualification, and competencies is an important contributing factor for facilitating pathways of regular migration and ensuring decent work. However, uh, sadly, this is yet to be widely established. Time has come that we scale up bilateral and regional partnership to ensure such recognition. Bangladesh has always been a great advocate for the rights and benefits of migrants and their families. In our continued efforts to ensure social protection for migrants, we formed a fund for rehabilitation and re-employment of jobless migrant workers who have returned home after losing their jobs overseas due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The affected migrants and their family members now are given humanitarian assistance, including financial aid. We are providing aspirant migrants easy and low-cost loans to relieve their financial stress while going abroad for jobs. 
the family of each expatriate worker who have passed away due to the COVID-19 pandemic is getting death compensation. A scholarship has been given to meritorious children of migrant workers. We need to ensure effective portability of benefits and entitlements as well. In this regard, a bilateral, regional, or multilateral social security agreement uh, could be concluded. This forum can facilitate uh, discourse and uh, dialogues on such international cooperation. We have made pre-departure training mandatory for all outgoing migrants to empower them and facilitate social cohesion in the destination countries. This training covers rules and regulations, food habits, safety and security, social norms and customs, and working conditions of the destination country. Language training has also been introduced. Despite all our endeavors, we have seen that my, uh, many of our migrants, particularly women migrants, have faced intolerance, abuse, and discrimination in the host countries. We hope that governments, IOM, and all other stakeholders will make efforts, concerted efforts, to put in place measures that would address the vulnerabilities of the migrants and strengthen their resilience against discrimination as well as economic shocks. I thank you, Madam. Thank you very much, China. We hear you. Go ahead. Yes, yes. Good afternoon, Ms. Polk, colleagues. I would like to add some additional information and recommendations. COVID-19 pandemic has severely affected migration and impacted stability of industrial and supply chains. Global migration becomes complex and fragile. It is urgent to overcome such impacts and help vulnerable migrants improve their resilience. During the United Nations General Assembly last year, President Xi Jinping put forward the Global Development Initiative, accelerating implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The 20th Congress of Communist Party of China has also stressed the idea of building the community with a shared future for mankind and creating a new form of civilization. Chinese government will be committed to building an economy open to the world, strengthening micro-policy coordination and safeguarding stability of industrial and supply chains, sticking to people-oriented development, giving priority to promoting development and ensuring people's well-being, facilitating international cooperation in poverty reduction and food security striving to address unbalanced and inadequate development, especially attaching great importance in protecting legitimate rights and interests of foreigners. Here, I would like to share some points of view. First, we should include migrants in national sustainable development plans to unleash their potential. We have delivered many inclusive initiatives to protect legitimate rights and interests of foreigners. We have introduced policies to facilitate extension of residence for foreigners in China, including automatic extension of residence permits, speeding up visa assurance for new foreign entrepreneurs, expanding assurance of long-term visas and residence permits, and enriching application of permanent resident permits. We have established migration service centers with bilingual service platform named 12367 with more than 2.8 million calls received. We have provided non-discriminatory medical observation and treatment for friends. Second, we should strengthen international cooperation and provide better conditions for migrants. The Chinese government has always taken an open, inclusive, and partial attitude towards migrants, upholding the opinion that Regular migrants do make contribution to social and economic development. China proposed that we practice extensive consultation, joint contribution, and shared benefits 
in global governance and real multilateralism. We should strengthen internet cooperation in order to improve economy and well-being in origin countries, as well as promote inclusion and integration of migration in primary destination countries. Third, we should strengthen exchange of experience and the practices to improve living environment for migrants. Under the impacts of the pandemic, it is obvious that the issue of migration management cannot be addressed by one nation alone. It is essential for competent authorities of all nations to strengthen exchange of experiences and best practices with the purpose of providing practical and effective solutions for migration management. Thank you for your attention. Many thanks, China. Uh, finally, we have the ambassador of Niger who is online. Madam moderator, it is uh, always a pleasure to see you moderating, particularly for this important panel. Congratulations to you and to the panelists for their excellent presentations. As we have always said, the geographical location of Niger between North and West Africa means that it is a country of transit. It is a country of great migration and it is also a country of destination and it is one with different characteristics. It is a country which has a long tradition of seasonal migration which is done through the sector going to neighboring countries and then there are people who leave in search of better economic resources. And that is why our economic development is linked to migration and the employment policy is a priority in our country and we have taken these aspects into consideration in our economic and social development plan and our national migration policy as well as uh, our national migration strategies. So it is through our different tools that the government has been fighting against vulnerability which has an impact on certain populations including migrant populations and above all children and women and that is why the government is strengthening its efforts to ensure migrants rights are respected and that they have access to decent work education and health care as well as ensuring they have access to protection social protection and this is being done through a number of of provisions for providing training and we also ensure that uh, there is the fundamental right for social protection which is uh, granted and this has legal coverage. The government has also a policy for promoting food security and to ensure that we uh, have land conservation as well as job creation in the productive sectors, particularly in rural areas. And we also support businesses being created in urban areas. We um, have a number of um, examples that we could go through, but I will conclude by saying we believe that because we face new challenges linked to migration such as 
the challenge of natural disasters, climate change, uh, and socio-political crises, uh, we need to ensure that there is greater protection given to migrants. We need to ensure that economic development programs that are national programs are given greater support. We also need to strengthen our global partnerships by showing international solidarity. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Merci à vous. Thank you for your very important statement. No, I think we are uh, ready to wrap up. So perhaps I could ask um, our three panelists to offer any closing views, um, especially including some of the very, very thoughtful uh, interventions we've had so far. Thank you. Uh, well, one, I'd like to emphasize again how uh, migrants find themselves in vulnerable situations, and therefore um, we hope that to achieve migrants' resilience, uh, our policy should be preventive as well, uh, so that migrants will not be placed in vulnerable situations. We've heard how we should uh, work so that migration is a matter of choice and not of survival. I'm uh, uh, very pleased as a country which receives and of course sends migrants to uh, hear the points raised by colleagues from around the world. In Asia, including Eurasia, we uh, have people coming in, coming out. Uh, we thank, for example, the intervention of our colleague uh, from China. Uh, and, and for Bangladesh, we are actually working together on a wage theft uh, uh, side event in the United Nations next month. And uh, it makes me proud. And uh, 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 now in French, nous avons écouté les messages de... Now, we have heard uh, the words from the ambassador of Niger. And I have to say that uh, I am very pleased to hear that Niger has policies that are very similar to those that we have in the Philippines, and that is policies for all people, whether they are migrants or not. But of course, we have a, a long way to go. Uh, we would like to thank you for your support. Uh, of course, we didn't hear from our colleagues from Latin America, uh, a nuestros hermanos y hermanas we haven't heard from our Spanish-speaking uh, colleagues, but we know that you also have uh, a very important role to play. Philippines and Mexico uh, worked together to sign uh, the Convention on Protecting Migrants and Their Families. Um, endeavor. And uh, similar as how we, uh, I hope I can say this, we have... Uh, conquered COVID, I hope. I, I, I don't want to jump the gun, but uh, we are actually meeting. Let's admit it, a few years ago, we didn't think we'd ever have something like this. Uh, in a, we thought it might take five years before we do something like this, but we're here. And I think we shall be able to advance the, uh, uh, continue to advance migrant workers. And uh, remember, all these are cross-cutting principles, including climate change, women's rights, children's rights. And uh, they're all consistent with uh, uh, the principles of the United Nations uh, Charter. Thank you. It's a great pleasure for me to have been here. Madame. Thank you, Undersecretary. Michelle. Well, thank you very much. Um, and I think there's been a lot said, and it's certainly been a rich discussion. Uh, and yes. I think I've, I've, I've heard from many different speakers, different aspects and angles, but I think the one uh, that we all keep in mind is that we're talking about human beings, and thank you for all the colleagues who've mentioned that this is not just about policy, this is about really people who are in the, in the process of having to move fighting issues of uh, discrimination and lack of protection. But they find themselves uh, also in the socioeconomic context in which countries are evolving. And as they move into uh, another country, they may or may not be subject to those kinds of uh, influences. Certainly discrimination against women is a huge issue in the context of the fact that women don't have access to jobs and the same jobs and equal treatment. The fact that migrant workers are uh, even more subject to wage discrepancies and unequal treatment than even uh, their, their national women counterparts. These are the vulnerabilities they face and climate change is going to exacerbate that 
in, in significant and exponential ways. So I think we have a lot to do, a lot to, um, to consider in terms of updating and scaling up our migration policies. But I want to pick up just on one note, because there was a lot of discussion about, of course, the national policy work we need to do and coherence between decent work, employment, and migration policies, but also about cooperation across borders. And I mentioned fair recruitment, but there is guidance now on bilateral labor migration agreements that the UN network adopted. And ILO and IOM were co-chairs of that, but it was multi-stakeholder involving many different um, groups in civil society, many UN agencies, and so on. This guidance was rolled out earlier this year, and it really pertains to cooperation agreements that can help uh, support a rights-based protections for migrant workers who are leaving climate-affected areas. So I think we would encourage you to take a look at those sorts of tools as well as things that are coming online, like Migrant Recruitment Advisor, which is like a trip advisor for migrant workers to report on the kinds of fees and costs they're paying. Uh, and there's many tools out there. I hope we'll have uh, opportunity for further exchanges as we go forward. But thank you very much. Thank you. And Vladimir, the last two minutes are yours. Thank you very much, DDG Pope. Uh, okay. Probably I will just uh, go with some kind of uh, also uh, interesting suggestions. Uh, I think uh, there is a need uh, to do some mapping of all good uh, practices that exist around the world, uh, uh, especially when it comes to the climate change, uh, migration, and uh, displacement. And I think uh, uh, it's not only Azerbaijan. I think we have so many countries around the world uh, that uh, can give a good an example of uh, uh, how we can address uh, those uh, vulnerabilities. And I think uh, once we have that mapping, maybe we can even do a little bit more promotion of those uh, best practices that uh, exist uh, and try to improve on those best practices that exist. And I think uh, uh, this will also help, I think, uh, climate financing. Uh, we will be able to probably a little bit more focus on uh, peace, innovations, uh, listen more innovation. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, basically uh, trying to uh, mimic the natural processes. I believe that is also one of the factors that we need to take into consideration for uh, our healthy planet and for our healthy uh, future. Uh, and I will just uh, finish with the uh, last sentence. Uh, I will just say that uh, all of these uh, policy strategies, uh, these are the dynamic uh, documents. Uh, they should remain dynamic and they just need to be probably reviewed and improved. Uh, I think uh, uh, I'm talking from the perspective of a person who was able to create some policies and work on the policies and improve over a period of time. So uh, no policy is a guarantee that uh, things can be fixed. Uh, uh, there is no one-time fix. Uh, we need to constantly work on those things and make sure that, uh, as I said, uh, uh, we'll uh, have an effect uh, on a uh, healthy planet and a uh, healthy population. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, there's quite a lot that has come out in the last um, hour and a half, um, but I think the bottom line is that there's a tremendous opportunity here um, for us all to work together to improve the labor mobility opportunities uh, for migrants around the world. And frankly, that's not just uh, an opportunity that we must take, but it's, it's an urgent requirement, particularly in the face of uh, changing climate. So um, I hope this conversation has helped um, spark some, some good ideas for all of you, and we look forward to continuing the conversation at, uh, when we reconvene the IDM tomorrow morning. Thanks very much.